Hi, my name is Mike Dillard, and this is a Self Made Man, the podcast for those who want to leave their mark on the world and create a legacy of honor, integrity, and achievement in every aspect of your life. I'm glad you're here, and once again, it is time to forge your destiny. Welcome back. Today, I'm excited to welcome Onyx Singal to the show. I've known Onyx for almost 10 years now, and over that time, I've watched him build huge online businesses and even partner up with Robert Kiyosaki, which was really cool to watch. But what I did not know is that a few years ago, Onyx had a massive crisis. His business crashed, he found himself in debt, and everything that he had built had crumbled. Essentially, he had to start over from scratch, which is very similar to what I went through personally back in 2013-2014. And the similarities between our stories are eerily similar, as we'll get into here during the show. But what's even more interesting is the fact that we both bounced back and came out of that situation, taking our biggest swings and risks ever. So Onyx started a new company called Learn that's spelled L-U-R-N. And he even launched a massive multi-million dollar co-working space for entrepreneurs just a few months ago. And what's really interesting is how they funded the project and how they plan to monetize it. You know, I've taken some big risks during my career as a business owner, so I know what it's like to go all in on your dream like Onik has. So I respect what he's doing here tremendously because it's a big endeavor. It's a really big risk and their mission behind it is very similar to Self-Made Man. So my hat's off to them and what they're doing. This is a fascinating interview with one of the most successful entrepreneurs out there today. It's filled with insights and lessons learned that you'll want to pay close attention to from both Onik and I as we've essentially cycled. We've made money, we've lost it, and we've made it again throughout our careers. And if you ever find yourself in that situation as well, well, just know that we've been there. <laughs> and, and it's all right. Keep moving forward. You'll come out the other side bigger, stronger, and wiser than ever before. So please help me welcome Onik Singal. Mr. Onik Singal, welcome to Self-Made Man, my friend. It's been a very long time since you and I have had a chance to to catch up, but I've been watching what you're doing with Learn, and it's been awesome, brother. Congratulations. Thank you very much, man. It has been a very long time, so it's good to hear your voice live, but uh, thank you. Uh, We've been doing a lot, keeping busy and uh, serving the entrepreneurial community. Now, for those of our listeners who have not come across you or your work. You know, you've been uh, essentially an online entrepreneur like I have for probably 10 plus years now. You've done a ton of work with Robert Kiyosaki and the Rich Dad brand. And now you've just opened up this amazing new physical school, if you will, for entrepreneurs. And take us back to kind of the beginning of your story. And for those, again, who who aren't familiar with it yet, I want to give them some context because you've had a hell of a career. Yeah, man. Well, first of all, thank you. And yes, we we really have. I've been doing this now for close to sixteen years. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. I feel like a I feel like a grandfather in this industry. Yep. Um. Yeah. I started <laughs> when I was in college, right, Mike? So I started when I was a junior in college, and here's why: I was bored of class. I I thought it was uh, really a waste of time to go learn all this stuff and not come implement. So I turned to a good good old friend back then. Just started Google. <laughs> I went to Google and I typed in how to make money. And Google had that auto suggest feature, right? So they a little drop down came and it said how to make money online. I thought, man, well, whatever, why not? <laughs> so I clicked on that, and of course I find all these like cool envelope stuffing, you know, scams and all that stuff. Went through all of that. Finally found this forum. Okay, I found this place, and I gotta tell you. It was probably that very forum that has encouraged me, inspired me, and led me to creating Learn Today. And I'll kind of get, I'll kind of close the loop was at it the end of the Warrior story. Forum? No, it was mm. a Blake. Mm. Cool. I don't know if you ever remember. There no. was a. It was more of a. It was more of a chat thread. It wasn't really a forum as much as it was like a, a uh, like a chat board. And so I went on this uh, this place, this forum, and I find people that are talking about things that sound legitimate, right? They're they're selling information. But they're selling digital information. Now, I was in college, so I know how many thousands every semester I would spend on textbooks. So this idea of information and paying for it made total sense. It was the perfect time of my life. Didn't sound like a scam. So I start researching it and I get into it and I start meeting these people and these guys are making six figures, you know, 100,000, 200,000, 300,000. They're working from their homes and 
working from their basements. I loved it. I loved everything about it, man. And so I start trying things and I'm hustling. No, no lack of hustle, working my butt off, going to school full time, coming back. No, no partying, no basketball games, no football games, just hustling. And you know what though? Time after time after time failing, nothing's working. I won't, nothing worked for me. Like I couldn't make it actually happen. And I still, till this day, do not know why I stuck it out. I have no idea. I should have quit. I really should have because it was 18 months and over 50 times, 50 times. I want everyone listening to just think about failing at something 50 times and still being able to put as much, you know, excitement and aggression into the whole process. It's not easy to do. Well, long story short, I was ready to quit. I couldn't take it anymore. I went to the forum and I said, guys, thank you so much for all your help over this last 18 months. I'm done. If I don't make any money tonight, I got 24 hours. I'm going to go get those great jobs that they're offering me. I'm out of this. <laughs> You know what? I get this. I get this. Uh, I get this message. This direct message on the forum, and I still get goosebumps when I talk about this. And Mike, I got to take a minute to tell this story because this is my way of outreaching. I hope one day this person hears it. I got a message on that forum, a direct message. We didn't have Skype and all that back then, right? So, a private message on the forum. It says, "Kid, been watching you for the last year. Very impressed with your hustle. I don't want to see you quit. I never help anyone. I never communicate in this forum. I have zero history, but you're the first one." I will help you through this private message for the next 24 hours. Ask me anything you want. I'll help you make money, but don't quit. Now, at that very moment, Mike, it's one of the core lessons we get in life as an entrepreneur. I had to make a decision, right? I learned this from Tony Robbins. I had to make a decision. And I'm always, uh, I'm always scared when I think about this because I could have just as easily decided not to take his help or her help. But I did decide to take it. And I didn't want to. I really thought someone's playing a prank on me. But I went, what do I have to lose? I took it till that that night until three in the morning. This person was messaging me back, telling me what to do, showing me how to do things. Finally, I passed out. I went to sleep. I woke up six hours later, ran to the computer, super excited, logged in, almost hit my head on the table, log in and boom, $300. Made more money that night sleeping in those six hours than I had made in 18 months combined. And that was it for me. I have never had one day in my life since that day where I made less than $300. That was an incredible day. And you know what? That person who showed me how to do it, never heard from them again. What, never I, could find them. I got I to gotta ask, yeah. what did he tell you to do differently that you could pull off in one night, right? Yes. So here's what he did. I was driving traffic and I kept sending it straight to the affiliate link. OK, mm. so I would send traffic like I would I would buy traffic from Google or I would do forum marketing or article marketing. And I just kept sending people straight to the software that I was trying to sell. He told me two things. One is he introduced me to the world of an opt in. Go figure back then. Right. So get someone get, getting someone to give you their email address. But that wasn't what did it for me. What did it for me was the simplest thing he said to me or he I keep saying he he mm. or she build a pre sell page. So it was a page that I wrote and I designed on something called Microsoft Front Page. I don't care what people oh, say. Oh, that's what I learned on. Love I love Front Page, man. Yeah. I miss it. I it was miss so it. much that's better. It was that or Dreamweaver. And Dreamweaver was like this super complicated thing, but yes. I could make Front Page work. I really want. I wish Front Page would come back. That's how yeah. I got into business. So, um, so I made this ugly page, right, with a headline and some copy. And then here's what I did. He said, what are you willing to do for someone that buys from you, right? And, and now it's so common for affiliates to do bonuses in the digital world. Back then, I was like, you know what? People get confused by this software. I know how to use it. I don't care. I'll give my cell phone away. People can call me. I'll give them free support. He's like, okay, put that on the page. So I threw that on the page. So what I did is I built a pre-sell page and I added my own bonuses. And I directed all of my traffic to that page, not to the merchant's page. And that was it. Mike, that was it. That was that was a little thing. That's why some so many of us, man, we are just literally one strike of the shovel away from gold and we quit. Right? Yeah, that's what I I, was, I I talk all the time. You're one you're one good sales presentation away from a seven or eight figure deal. Yeah, a absolutely. Yeah. With every no, you're closer to a yes. With every failure, you're closer to a success. That's all it took for me was that one little thing. And that was it. I mean, that was like a freight train that had started. I, I, from there on, the rest is a blur. I grew my business and never got a job, and I grew it up to ten million a year. So by two thousand eight, I'm on top of the world. I grew from a hundred dollars in my bank account to ten million a year, rocking it. And then two thousand eight happens. Right, the economy starts to collapse, doom and gloom. Everyone's running for the hills, and I'm sitting there thinking, nothing's happening to our industry. Everything looks good. Digital stuff is working well. Great. Double down. Grow more. Grow faster. 
Okay. Then making millions is not enough for me. I want to now make billions. So I want to build this big company. I want to build, you know, the Facebook of education and blah, blah. Now I haven't coded, you know, you could put a gun to my head right now and get a, tell me to put a web page up and I wouldn't know what to do. I'd say pull the trigger because I have no idea. Yeah. So I don't know anything technical, right? I'm going to leave everything I know and I'm going to build this. Year. So I go to India. Here's the first thing I do. I go to India to buy a company in Mumbai with 50 coders. I'm like, yeah, this is what I need. I need a bunch of developers because I want to build a tech platform. Okay, awesome. So I start throwing money at it, money at it, money at it. You know what? Fast forward two years. So n- note, note to self here and note to everybody listening. I did not buy fancy cars. I still lived in my parents' home, <laughs> okay? Yeah. I was not buying gold chains and gold teeth. I was just investing into my business thinking I'm doing the right thing. And 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 next thing I know, two years later, the economy's collapse took a couple of years to hit our industry. And everything just – it was like someone pulled the carpet out from underneath of me, man. I just fell. And I was $1.7 million in debt. I, I mean, I choke up just thinking about it. Imagine being 27, 28 years old, 1.7 million. My parents had to take a second mortgage on their home. My friends, a couple of them, gave me their life savings. I owed all my affiliates money. I is that, owed NASCAR. Is, is that debt to the IRS or did you take out loans or what? No, I took out loans. I took out, I, you know, we had done product launches. I owed affiliates a ton of money and I mm. couldn't pay them back because I spent it before I could pay them. I owed MasterCard, Visa, American Express, my local bank. We had a quarter million dollar line of credit. And it was just like everyone starts calling me and calling me. And Mike, I'm telling you right now, I, I it took me years to talk about this part of my life. But I was at the lowest of lows. Guys, there's that scene you see in Hollywood movies, right, where the guy is really down and out. And he's got a bottle of scotch and a brown paper bag. And he's in a motel and it's storming outside and it's raining. And he's sitting in the corner and he's just drinking it. And it's like the saddest scene. I'm not even kidding. Goa, India, that was me. I actually had a week where I disappeared. Nobody could track me down. My phone was off because I couldn't take any more calls from people telling me, pay me. I was borderline alcoholic by that point. My relationships fell apart. My health fell apart. I was ending up in the hospital every three three months, bleeding, having massive internal bleeding. Um, Nearly died a couple of times. And I think the wake up call for me was when I had to be pulled off of a plane right before it took off because I blacked out. They told me later that had the plane taken off, um, I would have died over the Atlantic Ocean. And so that to me, I came home from that and I was like, you know what? We got to make changes. But I, I, that was a, the best thing that ever happened to me, Mike. It was the best thing that ever happened to me because it made me really realize and learn entrepreneurship isn't about chasing money. That's when, that's why people face these issues is when they chase money. So for me, as I was going to make my, climb back. I said two things. I said, first of all, I'm not going to declare bankruptcy because the people I owe money to are people I love and care about. I'm not going to go tell them I declare bankruptcy. I'm going to pay them back. Secondly, if I don't have a true mission, a vision, a dream, something I want to change in the world, a value I want to create, then I'm not going to work for myself. I'll work for someone else who does have clarity. But I'm going to have, you know, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it for the right reasons. And I really asked myself, what do I want to do? What do I enjoy? What is my passion? And I realized it was working with entrepreneurs. I love entrepreneurship. It's literally in my blood. I love working with entrepreneurs, sitting around a table, brainstorming, hashing things out, problem solving, erupting new businesses. So that's what I started to build. 16 months later, so I I went from a team of 96 people in three offices down to no office and six people. 16 months later, every penny of my debt paid back, back on top, climbing, And that's what's led to the company that we are today. And every year we're seeing ridiculous growth because I'm clear on what I want to do, who I want to be, and I'm clear on every single thing that I've put in this book, right? Which is all about basically the saying is this, it's not what you know, it's who you know, right? That's what people say. I disagree. I say, it's not what you know. It's not who you know. It's who you are. I figured out the who you are part and nothing, I mean the biggest of challenges, have not been able to stop me. So I know that's a long-winded way of explaining my story, but God, I just want everyone to know, been there, done that, lot, uh, you know, highs, lows, you know, the drama, the drinking, the death, I've mean, got it all. And it's, so... It's so interesting. It's so interesting. You know... um, you know the video games that you play where you pick your primary category of character? Like maybe you're the knight, maybe you're the wizard, maybe you're the, the magic mage, right? But like there's four, five, six different primary categories of character that you can then go usually customize the, the look and feel. It's become so apparent to me that 
in the game of humanity, there is a character called entrepreneur because it seems like all of us have gone through the exact same cycle for very similar reasons. It's like we have this program that we're running, which causes us to, us to go through the same challenges and same cycles because my story in many ways reflects yours. And I know so many other entrepreneurs who've gone through the exact same thing. And it's just dawning on me now that like, this is really interesting. So I get it. I mean, I totally yeah. get it. I've been through, I've been through something very, 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 very similar. Biggest dreams in the world, biggest success in the world, followed by the biggest crash in the world, followed by way too much tequila, too many nights in a row for several years and uh, depression and, and all of that good shit. And then, and then you climb your way back out. <laughs> so, wow, it's interesting. So you do, you do have a phenomenal book coming out called Escape. And I'm hoping that you'll go into quite a bit of detail with us here today on what you've learned over the last three years, essentially writing this, because I think it's just going to be a game changer for a lot of people. I would love to. Any chance I get to talk about this book, I love. I'll do you one better, all right? Um, so along with not only going through the book in as much detail as humanly possible, I got nothing to hold back. This book for me is about the message. So someone buying the book, that's absolutely amazing. But you absorbing the message is what I'm after, is what I really want to do. So, so the fact that you're giving me this time to do that, I really appreciate that. Let me start with a confession about the book that will probably put the book in the right light for you. So three years ago, when I made a determination as to what I was going to be, who I was going to be, and who I was going to help, and what Learn was going to become, I realized that my branding over the last decade past that had put me in this place of being the internet marketing guy. And if you could see me right now, I'm doing quotes, you know, the internet marketing guy. Yeah, another, and, another you know, similar challenge, yeah. Exactly. Right. And I look, I love digital marketing. It is it, it oozes. People ask me, what's your you know, what's your hobby? And I'm like, seriously, it's it's digital marketing. It's like a game for me. I love it. But I don't want to be known for just that. I love, you know, just recently I helped the guy who um, who details my cars. I helped him triple his business. Because what you'll learn is you can take a successful entrepreneur. It doesn't matter if they're doing a digital business or running a factory. If they have the proper elements in place that we go over in this book, they can run any kind of business. You could take them out of any business and pluck them somewhere else and they'll, they'll be able to figure it out. So three years ago, I started with a very selfish motive. I said, I need to write a book that's going to rebrand myself and the company as not just an internet marketing company, but here for the entrepreneur. So I thought, awesome, we're going to write more of a generic book about how to be a powerful entrepreneur that would be effective for anyone, you know, offline, online, whatever. And so I, I was thinking about it. I was meditating about it. Like, what is the topic? What do I want to do? And I came upon, okay, so I came upon this question. I thought, you know what? What is the difference between someone who succeeds as an entrepreneur and someone who doesn't? Why do 80% of businesses fail? That's like a ridiculous number. So sure, why don't we do some research and write about that? That sounds like a good topic. All right, great. Okay. So I start to do my research. The first person, of course, my first subject was me, right? So I look at my own story. What led my what led to my demise? What led to my victories? What led me to winning and climbing back up? And then I start to look. And then I'm like, hey, I can interview some of my top students. I've got amazing students who've become millionaires. Let's go talk to them. At the same time, I've got a ton of students who are not millionaires and who've been with me for years and are smart and are hardworking. And then I thought, well, man, I know a lot of millionaires. I know a lot of successful entrepreneurs. Let's start calling them and talking to them. I don't know at what point this went from a selfish product or a selfish project that was meant to help me rebrand to a total passion, addiction, obsession. I that got to a point where I couldn't sleep at night because I started realizing I have trained over 250,000 students worldwide. Why is it that a majority of them are struggling to become entrepreneurs when the ones who become ragingly successful have access to the same tools, the same coaching, the same training, the same everything? So I just, you know, I really began to dive into it very deep. And so this has been, there have been three major components or contributors to the book. One is myself and my story. Second is my successful students versus my not successful students. And then the third is, of course, very successful millionaires and billionaires who I've been able to sit with and talk to and, and absorb. And, 
as I did this, Mike, I got so excited because indeed I saw a common trend. Indeed. I, it was, it was too loud and too clear to ignore for too long. And so I started to put it all together. I started to kind of mind map it all, put it on the whiteboard and started to group things together. And one night I you know, God, I don't know if someone believes in like divine intervention, but this was totally one of those. Remember when I'm going to sleep, and the word escape came to my mind. And I thought, ah, I love that word, right? Trying to like escape your current life and the escape plan, you know, breaking out. And I thought, wait a minute, you know, there's a little, so like there's an E in the beginning and an E at the end. That's like how to go from employee, right? So if you look at the logo of the book, it's little E, capital S-C-A-P, E, all capital. But the first one's low. So it's how to go from employee to entrepreneur. And then the four letters in the middle, I'm like, Man, you know, let's see if my let's see if they make sense and all it just popped out at me. I said these are the four stages because if I look at the characteristics that I'm studying and seeing in successful entrepreneurs, they group themselves almost perfectly in these buckets. So S stands for well, S is stage 1 and it stands for self, right? And we'll come back and talk a little bit more in detail about each one. Stage 2 is C. That's catapult. Stage 3 is A, that's authority. Stage four is P, that's people. So these are the four stages. And really the way it works is see most of us in the world. So I want you to imagine a triangle now in your mind. Just have a triangle, okay? The base of the triangle, the very base, draw a little sliver so it's a little chunk of the base, is E, employee. Because most of the people in this world are employees. Now, as you go one level up, right? So you go a little bit higher and you draw another line. So you have another section of the triangle, Notice how it's smaller than the section below it because a triangle obviously gets smaller as it gets to the pinnacle. Well, that's S because a lot of people who are employees enter the personal development space to work on themselves. So it gets obviously less than everybody. So it's a little smaller people that are focused on improving themselves in the S category. And then you go a little bit higher than that, you get C, catapult. So even less people make it out of the self successfully to go to catapult and then even less make it from there to authority. And then the final frontier to successful entrepreneurship is, is in my opinion, is P people. They're the hardest ones to deal with because you're dealing with emotion. You're dealing with people and hearts and, and just a lot of things. So in S here's what I discovered. Unfortunately, we are all trained away from being an entrepreneur. I per, I actually believe we are all hundred percent of us are born entrepreneurs. If you want proof to that, watch a toddler. Just watch a toddler go about their day exploring, learning, and not taking you for your word. In many cases, not caring what you say and don't say. So a couple of examples, right? A toddler learning to walk. Think about how difficult it is for them to do. How many times they fall, how many times they cry, how many times they hurt themselves, yet almost every toddler will learn to walk right? I find that trait to be very entrepreneurial or an even better story. When I was with my nephew, um, I played a little test on him. So my nephew was three, three and a half years old. I said, Hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he looks at me and he said, war machine, you know, now, first of all, I took offense to that for the Mm -hmm. very man fan. And so why would you ever aspire Mm -hmm. to be a sidekick? So first we had an argument about that, but he held his ground (laughs) and wanted to be iron man. So secondly, I said, you know, iron man doesn't exist. It's not possible to be Iron Man. Oh, ho, ho, ho. should I not have said that? Because you should have seen his face. No one was going to tell him that he can't be Iron. I mean, that he can't be a war machine. Sorry, I meant to say. He he literally said. He he just looked at me, stomped his foot, and he said, "I want to be War Machine, and I will be." Hmm. And I looked at him and I said, "Man, oh man, I am so sad to know that you're about to go into a system that's going to beat that out of you." Because pretty soon what's going to happen is he's going to start going to school and he's going to want good grades so he can come home and get the accolades from his parents, from his teachers. He's going to want to start living to please others. He's going to start doing things and not doing things based on what others want. And from from there, he'll go to high school and he'll be focused on building this rap sheet so that he can get into college from someone who doesn't know him. Someone who doesn't have a clue who he is is going to read one page and determine if he's worthy of their university that doesn't end there. You're going to go to the university and now you have to build a rap sheet so that one day a recruiter will hire you for a job. doesn't end there. You'll get your job and then you'll go there and then you'll have to work hard to continue to impress your boss 
so that he may promote you, so that you will work up the ladder and only one day maybe you make, make this great salary. Well, we are, we, we're, we're literally not focused on the self. An entrepreneur, the minute you go to entrepreneurship, that rips right away. There is no more boss. There is no one else to please. You got you to gotta do your own thing. And most people can't process that because we've never been taught to. So that's S. There's five characteristics within S that we always, um, you know, that, that you can dive into. But moving forward to C, now here's one that nobody talks about, catapult. So catapult is another way of saying creating momentum. Okay, so I get students all the time, Mike, I'm sure you're used to this and come to you and say, I just, I want to make a million dollars, man. I want to make a million dollars. Tell me how I do it. And I always, I have like the best answer that irritates every single one of them. I look at them and I say, have you made a hundred? And they'll look at me and say, man, a hundred. No, I want to make a million. Like, have you made a hundred? Mm-hmm. And like, well, I mean, no, but I could. Well, great. Go make a hundred and then make a thousand. You know how you make a thousand? You do what you did to make a hundred ten times and then go make 10,000. You know how you make 10,000? Go do what you did to make a thousand ten times. Then go make a hundred thousand. You know how to make that? Go do what you did to make 10,000 ten times. And then you go make your million. You know how you do that? Do what you did to make a hundred thousand ten times. And people will look at me, oh man, I hate your answer. But I'm like, that, that's how I did it. See, too many of us, we want to just close our eyes and bam, we want to appear at the top. We want to take the elevator. There is no elevator. There is a staircase. There isn't even an escalator, right? You got to build steps into the process. You got to go after micro goals and actually systemize your approach to getting to where you want to go. The successful entrepreneurs, they know how to use momentum. They know how to create momentum. They know how to do small things to get those cycles going, those engines started. Think of it this way. A car at rest is incredibly difficult to push. If you put a car in park and start trying to push it, it's going to take a lot of might, a lot of energy to get it to move. But once that car is moving, one person most likely with one hand on the car could actually keep that car in motion. So creating momentum is incredibly important. So that's the second stage. Stage number three is authority. Now, again, go back to when we were in school. You're in a class. Let's say you got 40 kids in a class. How many class leaders do you have? One. Okay, let's go to athletic team. How many team captains do you have? One. How many kids are not getting a chance to practice leadership and authority when the one that's always taking the chance is is stepping up? 39 of the 40 don't get that chance just because they're a little bit shy to step up first. But the thing is, when you're an entrepreneur, whether you don't need to be a charismatic speaker talking to 30,000 people and inspiring revolutions, but you need to be able to inspire your customers, your employees, your vendors. You need to be able to lead them. You need to be able to communicate, problem solve. (laughs) These are not skills we're taught. Why? Because when we go to work, we don't need any of that. Do what you're told. Actually, having a lot of A could be a problem at work. So take it away. Well, now we have to rebuild it. Well, good news is it's not too late. It's never too late. Last but not least, P. Now, I love P because P is people. And this is where I got to tell you, I feel like I have excelled the most in my life. And I give most of my credit of my success to this last stage. It's the toughest, but luckily and fortunately for me, the one I mastered the most. There is, Mike, there is not a single problem in my life right now that I could not get solved by simply going to my network. And I'm sure if you're on my Facebook, Mike, you've seen it many times. I put posts up looking for this, need that, anyone know this? And man, within seconds, the smartest people all over the world are giving me my answers. I can text people. I can call people. I can Skype people. But that's not necessarily what P is about. That's what everyone thinks. It. Oh, Onyx just talking about building a network. No, I am talking about how you manage your environment. So I'll give this prime example of where I contest in this book big time. The old adage taught to us in the personal development space is negative people should be kicked out of your life. Remove negativity, they say, right? Well, when I was starting my business, my father was negative. He was scared for me. He didn't know what I was doing. He couldn't support me. I didn't have any support in my entire family. So my father was negative. This man is the most, he is probably the most influential person in my life. He is the most supportive person in my life, but he was negative at that time. My mother, when I was launching this facility that you spoke about, Mike, I cost me three and a half million dollars. Until this day, I have no idea how it's going to make money. It was just something I knew I needed to do. Three and a half million dollars. My mother was negative. (laughs) When I first met my now wife, back then girlfriend and then fiance, she was negative when she found out that I wanted to go take over the world. 
she thought, why can't we just have good money, live a good life and enjoy it? Why do you want to do all this? What if bad things happen? I just named three of the most powerful, supportive, amazing, generous people I know. What would have happened if I kicked them out of my life because they were being negative? See, what we have to understand about people is that most people who take the time to be negative to you are doing it to protect you. There's a very small portion of people that are actually toxic. Toxic people need to be removed. So we go over something I call the triangle of support in this book where I help you understand that only 3 to 5% of the people that you think need to be kicked out actually need to be kicked out. The rest of them, you need to learn to manage your relationship and manage how you communicate with them. So the onerous of turning a negative person to positive is actually on you, not on them. So I just know now when I'm with my mom talking about the facility, I, I focus on different aspects of the conversation. With my wife, when I'm about to do something highly risky, I approach it in a different way to address the sensitivity that she may face about it. See, all of this, that's a lot of stuff that's got to go down, Mike, in a, in a successful entrepreneur's mind and their behavior. We're not taught any of this. And I realized that the first step to getting people to learn it was to acknowledge that it existed. And, and that's really, we, we don't just talk about all of this in the book, but we get into the details, into the weeds of all of it in the book. And we give you specific exercises and things to do to implement these. And then my favorite one is, of course, in the book, we give you a quiz. It's a 30 to 45 minute assessment. It's really an assessment. At the end of the assessment, you get a beautiful report back that shows you what we call your e-score. It'll actually tell you how likely you are to succeed as an entrepreneur. But the best part about it is it's a very detailed, by the way, it's a super long report, beautiful graphs and charts. It'll actually score you on each of these four stages and tell you specifically where you need to work the most to raise your score the most. So, so really this book, that's what we did. We wanted to really outline the concept of entrepreneurship, what it takes to be an entrepreneur, who an entrepreneur is. Last but not least, we also introduce a notion in this book, Mike, that I'm sure you're very aware of, but it's not being publicly talked about, and that is intrapreneurship. I don't think most people even know this exists, but entire Silicon Valley is built off of this. Google, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Microsoft, Yahoo. These companies are built off of what they call intrapreneurship, which is a type of entrepreneur. And we talk about that in this book. Not everyone needs to start their own business and take on all of that headache. Many well, people. Let's, uh, yeah. let's define that for everybody real quick. Sure. An intrapreneur is someone who displays and takes ownership over a division or department or a segment of a business as if it was their own, but within a larger organization. So in and learn here, we don't hire employees. We don't use that word. We hire intrapreneurs. If you are in this company, you own your department, you own your task, you own your division. No one's going to micromanage you or oversee you. We look for you to make contribution. We look for you to excel and grow. Google Mail, right? Gmail. That was a product of an intrapreneur at Google. Sony PlayStation, most people don't know this, was invented because an employee of Sony thought Nintendo sucked and was mm. tinkering with it and invented the Sony PlayStation. Google AdSense which led to Google's wealth, was a product of entrepreneurship. Facebook newsfeed ads, product of entrepreneurship. And the list goes on. Some of the most successful things around us were invented by entrepreneurs that were within a large organization, treating that large organization almost as if it was their VC. Yeah, you know, I think it's a phenomenally powerful way to learn a skill set where you're essentially getting paid, like you said, to build your own little division within a company. And assuming you do that successfully, your options are endless at that point. It means you can go do it again for yourself if you want, for another company if you want. But the fact that you took ownership of the entire process, and if you want to do it in a way that is incredibly rewarding do that on the marketing and sales side of things, you know, like Absolutely. if you can come in as, yeah. as, you know, an intern or whomever into a marketing organization and you take it upon yourself to master customer acquisition for, let's say YouTube as a channel and you do that successfully, you can do whatever you want at that point. You can write a check, you can ask for a raise, you can go start a business, start an agency. Your options are endless at that point. So I think that's a, a phenomenally powerful idea. 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So we explore that in the book as well. And the quiz helps someone determine and understand, hey, are they more suited for entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship? Or, hey, maybe they're more suited to just, you know, be at a company and support the company and their dreams and missions. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Very cool. Well, I want to ask you while we've got a few minutes left more about your plans for your learn center. You just you just had the big grand opening literally like a couple of weeks ago, a month ago. Tell us about what it is, what's in it, how big it is, the uh, facilities you have inside and why you felt compelled to build it. Uh, thank you for asking that, Mike. I love talking about this place. So uh, I'll give you some of the um, some of the data. So 26,000 square feet here in Rockville, Maryland, about 30 minutes um, from Washington, D.C. 26,000 square feet. That includes a 200-person lecture hall. We have over a million dollars worth of audiovisual equipment in here. We have two classrooms, 40-seater, a 60-seater. We have a state-of-the-art video studio. We have two audio studios. We have a nap room. We have a whiteboarding room. We have two meeting rooms, conference rooms, co-work space, offices for rent, Video game room, ping pong tables, foosball tables. We've built what I like to say is a playground for entrepreneurs. And why, someone says, right? That's a great question. And the truth of it is because, and I'm going to say every single thing I'm saying now, albeit might be unbelievable, it is very true. I built it for the community. I built it because it was needed. Our vision is to build 50 of these learn centers across the world in the next 10 years and to connect entrepreneurs worldwide. The truth is we don't have a community, that we don't have a place that we can call home, whereas most professions, let's say you're a developer, you go to work every day, you get to sit amongst people that are your peers, you work with other developers, you're in different, you're in the same organizations and associations, you're a doctor, you're a lawyer, engineer, you name it. You go to work every day, you're around those who are like you. Entrepreneurs are so busy, it's such a lonely business, we're so busy trying to build our own businesses, we don't got time to support one another, to be with one another, to just kind of create that peership. So we built this facility to draw entrepreneurs in. The truth for us was we already needed a place to do events and we needed a place to put our growing, fast growing team. And the way it worked out was we spent so much money with hotels just to run a few events. We decided, man, invest that money and build ourselves a facility. We can run our events. We can have our friends who are amazing entrepreneurs rent our facility to run their events. We can have co-work space. So we have talent here. We can have a fun Silicon Valley, you know, of the East Coast feel, bring entrepreneurship, young, vibrant entrepreneurship out. Every Saturday, we run free training. This past Saturday, we ran a training with over 120 people from the community came in. It's absolutely free. Walk in. And so people are asking me, Anik, what's your goal here? And really, it is truly to serve the community. We'll figure out how to make money from it at some point. I've been blessed with money. Our online business does absolutely amazing. The facility is needed for our events. I needed a video studio. I needed an office space. So we'll figure out how to make money from it. But we we are working on something pretty incredible for those who want to get into the digital marketing world. We are working on something that would utilize the entire facility and help people make big career changes. But more than anything, it's really just for the community. We just want people to come use this place and make their journey of becoming an entrepreneur that much easier on them. You know, I this is a, a living embodiment of the quote that is often circulated in this world, that the definition of an entrepreneur is somebody who jumps out of a plane and figures out how to make a parachute on the way down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. And that's why my mom gets a little nervous about my Learn Center because she wants to know how that three and a half million is going to come back in my pocket. And I told her, well, that, we'll figure it out. Uh, well, that's what I want to ask you real quick because I have, I have a vision that's been in my head for a couple of years now for Self Made Man that I have this goal to make a co-working space in Austin that is similar to like a WeWork, but it's obviously branded self-made man, like the look, the feel, all of that stuff. Uh, You know, we've got a lecture hall, we've got a video studio that people can come in and rent out, you know, and produce their content there and, and a gym and kitchen and all of that stuff, right? And so that's in my head. And obviously to do it right and to do it the way I want, it would probably cost a similar amount of money. Did you guys, if you don't mind me asking, did you take out loans for this? Did you pay in cash? Did you find investors? But like, that's a big, that's a big chunk of cash, right? No, absolutely. And no, I don't mind you asking whatsoever. So Mike, I had my first dream about this place six years ago. Um, Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, when I sat down with the architect, uh, first of all, it took us a long time to find the perfect location to build it. And I think we did. I, I love working with the landlords we have and 
It was a great deal. But um, years ago, I began to draw the place and I knew what kinds of rooms I want, how big they should be, how many they'll seat. And all of these visions came to me. I don't know where they came from, but they came. And I, and I, and I wrote them down. By the time I sat down with the architect, they were like, okay, so tell us, you know, what do you want? And I said, give me that piece of paper. And I drew the whole thing and I, and I took, I drew it over the blueprint. And I said, now find a way to make that legal. And they were literally dumbfounded. They said they've been working with clients for 30 years and not one has ever been able to draw something that they just knew what they wanted. So for me, I started saving up for the facility six years ago. I started making sure my financials would look the way they needed to. I started talking to banks and I started talking to leasing companies and places where I would be able to to t- get a loan or get some money to help. First and foremost, Mike, if you find the right deal, the landlord will give you a tremendous amount of what they call TI dollars, which is tenant improvement dollars. So they'll pay for a lot of the renovation of your location. For us, so you're so you're leasing. We are leasing. Yes, I didn't buy okay. this location. Um, okay. You know that would have made it much more expensive. Now that's part of our wealth planning strategy in the future um, to start to actually buy the place where we're building these. But we need to build at least three to four first, prove out the the model. Right. So first and foremost, we had the TI dollar, which covered about 35 to 40 percent of the entire um, budget. Secondly, the largest expenditure, or I shouldn't say the largest, but maybe one of the largest, or if not the second largest, was our audiovisual equipment. We really have incredibly advanced facilities here. We can run four live events out of this facility at any given time and stream them and have live mixing and all kinds of craziness happening. We could do a TV show here if we wanted. That's the level of the equipment. So the equipment and the furniture for the place were a really big bill. Well, fortunately, you don't need to do what they call a traditional loan for those kinds of things. You can actually go to what they call leasing companies that act like a loan. But what they do is in turn, they buy the furniture. So you go buy whatever you want and they buy it from you and then lease it back to you. So it's basically like a loan, except it's typically guaranteed only by the assets that they own. So it doesn't go into the entrepreneur's personal financial issues. Third, we had just saved up a ton of money for it. So we were ready. So outside of that, we didn't, I, I, I've taken on zero. So check this out. Because we planned, right, and something we talk about in this book very much so about a good entrepreneur, we planned so well that me personally as the entrepreneur took on zero additional risk in my life. If everything imploded tomorrow, it does not touch me personally at all. Mm. Yeah, that's great. That's uh, that's very much a Richard Branson-esque move is focusing on the big dream but making sure that the downside is protected yeah. and, and that you well, minimize that. Mike, here's what we spent last year to do six events. We spent $800,000 between audiovisual companies and the hotels. Mm. And a large chunk, we have dropped that cost by by 80%. So that's what you spent on running events for yourself before you had this facility. Absolutely, right. yeah. And so you just, for us, you know, this facility can be <laughs> fully empty and it's still in profit. <laughs> that's that's how crazy right. it is. So we really did our we did our numbers. It wasn't, you know, I wanted to do this, but there's a reason I waited 5 plus years to build it. There had to, it was a timing thing. It had to be the right time where it made the perfect sense and it does now. And this is why I can take a sigh of relief and let this place build itself. Let the entrepreneurs tell us what they want rather than me shove my ideas down their throats. I'm not in a rush to get this place to burn out or churn out a bunch of profit. I'm in the place right now where I already use the place, the facility, where let's get it right, let's build the team properly, let's get people in here who need the facility, and let's give them what they need. And that that is a blessing that I have that I'm very, very, very grateful and thankful to have. But um, yeah, that, and that that's exactly how we did it. And I love every minute of it, man. This I haven't missed a day of work in months. Otherwise, before when we were at co-work spaces, I used to skip half the time work from home. This I love coming here. This place has got a different energy to it. Yeah, very cool, man. I'm uh, I'm super excited for you and and that's definitely something that's on my uh on my dream board as well. And so it's really cool to to have a friend that's just done it. Well, so. you know what? Austin is on our list, my friend. So if we come out there, maybe there's something we can do. We'll grab some space together. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Very cool. Well, Anik, thank you so much for joining us today, man. This has been awesome. It's been great to catch up and, and I really appreciate hearing your story in detail and in ways that I haven't before. 
when is the book coming out and where can people get a copy? Yeah, so the book is uh, August 14th and it's for free. Well, you just pay for the shipping and handling and we'll, we'll, we actually go on loss to deliver every book. I told you it's about the message, not, not the money and go to escapebook.com. So escape, E S C A P E book, B O O K.com escapebook.com. And you'll be able to grab an absolutely free copy of it. Just pay for shipping and handling. And here's a cool thing. We don't make you wait until you get the book in the mail because sometimes for people that are international, it can take weeks to get to you. We have no control over that, but what we will do for you is the second you pay shipping and handling, we will give you free access to our online classroom um, alongside of 25 other courses that are for free inside of our Learn Nation platform, virtual. So you actually can start reading this book in the next five minutes if you just go to escapebook.com. And the uh, and the physical copy will still be uh, shipped, just to clarify. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. The physical copy <laughs> will still be shipped. Uh, it will reach you. Some of you will get it very quickly. Others might take longer. It just depends on the po- you know the postal yeah, system. For really. sure, for sure. Awesome, brother. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I wish you the best. I can't wait to uh, see the facility next time I'm in DC. I'm definitely going to swing by. And uh, this has been awesome, brother. Thank you for the time. Thank you, man. It's been a pleasure, been an honor. I, I always love talking to amazing entrepreneurs and amazing leaders and people that are out there just trying to change the world like you are. Hats off to you, Mike, for everything you do for such an amazing podcast and for just amazing work you do across the board. Thank you for having me on and uh, look forward to getting to know every single person who was listening. See you guys at escapebook.com. Grab yourself a copy and we'll go from there. Awesome. 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 Well, guys, you know how this ends. Thank you as always for listening. Can't wait to see you next week on our next show. Take care.